This episode is sponsored by Elliot's employer, the CIA. Uh, we mostly just take pictures of people in underwear and use it as blackmail. The funny side of the CIA. The, the, f- the funny side. Elliot the- works for the goofy side of the feds. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the part that's been around since the OSS. <laughs> the the diversity hire over here is there for comedic effect. <laughs> Jesus. I will confirm or deny none of this. Let's see? Uh, welcome back, everyone. This is a very fun episode, or a series episode. I mean, it could be a fun episode. We'll find out. We'll, we'll see how much Matt enjoys this lovely topic. Bad episode, good series. Good, bad, wow. Let's, let's really reel him in with that. Bad episode, good series. Um, so I've been wanting to do this series uh, in some capacity, whether or not there was a podcast attached to it or not, uh, for like a number of years now. I've really like wanted to have this like long-term discussion that I think is just entirely lacking on the like whatever space you want to call this. Yeah, did you just did he did he just say years? I mean, oh, Elliot, I didn't there shouldn't be like a surprise every time you talk to Andy, it's like the first time you've met him. How can you be constantly angered by uh like going back years? I mean, it it comes out as anger, but it's really just like a twisted form of spite that's mixed with being kind of impressed and dumbfounded mostly. But honestly, I think at the end of it, it's that little dopamine hit that I get when I feel like I'm not the only one crazy and I don't feel so alone. That's fair. There's at least three of us. Oh, I feel so loved right now. So the reason why I want to do this episode or this series of episodes, which is going to be, I think, about 12 to 15, we'll, we'll see kind of how it plays out, is because in the process of the 200 episodes or so we've done at this point, we've been pretty critical of like a number of the alternative agriculture movements here in the United States. I'll say. And just for clarity, that number is all of the alternative <laughs> agricultural movements here in the United States. And the mainstream, too. Yes. We had three hours of content that we did not record when I mentioned no-tail. <laughs> Andy went off on a You don't even want to know. On a tear. It was so fun. Yeah, we had to inject him with morphine to get him to stop. Mm, that sweet, sweet drip. Now, we have talked about, to an extent, like organic farming, permaculture, homesteading, biochar. I just watched Elliot seize a little bit as I said that. And like all these different things that are like hyped up to save food or whatever. And you might be thinking like, okay, so like nothing's perfect. So what? At least these people are trying to create a better food system than what exists today, right? And that's valid. But I I also think it's really important to contextualize these movements to fully understand how they relate to the other concurrent movements like agroecology that are happening and also how they relate to conventional agriculture as well as like bigger picture stuff. Like no one listening to this isn't aware of like the trad movement and like homesteading where it's like hyper conservative, the blood and soil fascism that also supports a lot of homestead movements. Like why are there these overlaps? We can't fully understand that if we're not willing to contextualize and fully understand what exists around us. Right. So we spent some time talking about a bunch of these different areas from kind of, again, a periphery, right? So we've talked about corn. We've talked about the history of foraging. Uh, the Mayawaki forests, which are or Mayawaki forests, which are a part of some of the permaculture stuff. Fukuoka, the Pro Model series, where we talk about like a very historical horticultural subsistence style lifestyles, and all these together kind of give us this really, I, at least I think, thorough understanding of the roots of many of the methods that are advocated by like youtubers and influencers and on like social media right and i i I think the key point is that we have to understand that none of this exists inside of a vacuum and if we don't understand it within this bigger context we can misappropriate or miss things that are indicators of a, a much bigger issue right oh my god that's a lot of words to just say it's complicated well yes and no it's a pretty good impression Honestly, I don't even know why I talk. Elliot could just cover my voice. That's amazing. Yeah, I could totally do it. This series that we're, we're uh, framing up right now is going to explore the evolution of agriculture from the side of perennial agriculture, soil science, and how this evolved into kind of, let's say, four main threads around alternative agriculture. You've got like the Permi regenerative ag movement, which granted was founded in Australia, but 
can't really talk about alternative ag without talking about permaculture. Plus, it's based in English language, so like I think it it's much easier to blend into like American culture, right? Then you've got like the organic movement, the biodynamic movement, which also came out of Germany. But the overlaps are so significant and important that it's we, we can't really not talk about it. And I know a lot of people have messaged us asking for us to talk about biodynamics. So we're going to do it. And then there's agroecology, which we've been more in support of than anything else. And to go back to my initial point about like, why is this important? There is a lot of overlap between these movements, right? But again, if we understand why they evolved out of the same historical context and went in different directions, we can start to tease out these significant pieces and have a better understanding of how these movements will unfold going into the future. And like, given climate change and, you know, ecological collapse and economic collapse and all these things, that that process that might have taken hundreds of years might only take 30 or 40 years because that accelerationism is just going to push is going to step on the gas, right? So we really need to understand why it's important to understand the nuance between these movements, their historical context. And uh, I think the next dozen episodes or so are going to be really insightful in understanding this history of perennial agriculture. Oh, I thought that was a joke at the beginning of the episode when you said dozen to 15. You're, you're like dead serious. Dead as Black Cat, R.I.P. R.I.P. Black Cat died? The black cat died last weekend. I did not know that. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I had him in high school, so Elliot like knew him. That cat was like 30 years old. Or, 21. Or 20, but yeah, he, 21. He was, uh, sorry, 20 years old. He was a legend. Yeah. Everyone knew him. Damn. R.I.P. Black Cat. So R.I.P. Black Cat. R.I.P. Pour one out. Carry on, Matt. Oh, I was just... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, fun fact for our listeners, we record all these episodes back to back, so we're on... Uh, we're on day 15 of 24-hour <laughs> recording. Yeah, that's why no one knew, is because they haven't slept in three days. Even though the cat was literally here, we put him down in the studio. And then I fired up the fireplace to, to cremate him. The, the, it just, no short-term memory right now. The brain synapses are just not working. Oof. Was that true? Man. No. Oh my nothing god. Like a, uh, <laughs> nothing like a little home cremation on a uh, on a gas fireplace. First off, wood. Come on. The firebox isn't very big. He was a big cat. We made it work. I really thought you just cremated your cat in your house. <laughs> I'm not that redneck, Elliot. Come on now. Listen, back to the episode. If anybody yes. Um, I, I know our listeners love our podcast, but if you don't if you don't want to sit through twelve to fifteen hours of Andy Bloviating about Whatever the hell he's talking about, you can just watch any post apocalyptic movie like the ones we've been mentioning for the past, I don't know, two years, like Tank Girl. Four, Elliot, four years. Four, four years we've been doing this? Yes, four. We're on season four, man. This is season four. Good Lord. Uh, time has time no meaning. Time flies when you're having time fun. Time has no meaning. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's been the worst year every year since we started this podcast it's amazing i think it really has that's really good for us isn't it it's great for our, our audience for growth carry on much like the oil companies we keep doing better and better um okay so basically what i want to do is really tie all this together and that begins with going back in history right and I think this is important because I've never seen anyone do this before or try to tie this in a way that's like comprehensive and it really needs to be done. And um, I do want to preface this with if we're doing 12 to 15 or so episodes, there are going to be a lot of stories that are not going to be brought up. That doesn't mean they're not important, but I'm sure you all remember the B series and uh, it can drag on when you try to make everything fit. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot for me. It was a lot to take in. And I was participating in it. So I'm trying to remember all the stuff that you taught me about bees in four hours. And all I four, all I four, keep coming... Like 16 hours, first off. Was it that long? Yeah. Bro, I had you. How many episodes did we For do? For me, it's, it's, it was mostly being annoyed at the puns. Yes. Yeah, mostly. I think that's mostly all I remember. Anger. And I'm, pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure I blacked most of it out as like a bad memory. Probably. I think that points to like the problems of trying to create this like very compre comprehensive, complex narrative. We're going to try to do that as best as we can this series. Okay, so who are we talking about today? And are we just going to keep talking about talking about people? Or are we going to get to the subject of this episode? 
So we're going to talk about a man named Franklin Haram King, or F.H. King. And you could call him a king of soil science in the 19th century. Okay, so we really don't have to go that far back this episode. I'm not angry about it. Also, coming back at us with the uh, two-letter, two then last name. I'm, uh, I'm here for it. The E.E. E. Cummings of soil. I'm pretty sure Franklin Hiram King sounds like a high school near me, I think. <laughs> kind of does. Our, our buddy F.H. King is basically unknown outside of like very specific soil nerds. If you find someone that's like really into like J. Russell Smith or something, they might, might be familiar with King's book, Farmers of 40 Centuries. Uh, but generally speaking, that's about the extent of their knowledge. Uh, and there's good reason for that. While this book did reverberate across the agricultural sector, as we'll discuss, uh, it was published actually posthumously. It was one of many, many lasting discoveries that he made. Nerds, are you guys ready to do this? No. Yes. Hey there, it's me, Crazy Norm, down at Normal Norm's Nut Emporium on John Brown Drive. We're going nuts for nuts in Nutty November. We've got big nuts, small nuts, chestnuts, ground nuts, nut butter, buttery nuts, nut milk, milky nuts, nut cream, creamy nuts, and the for the late night crowd, chocolate covered CBD, deep fried nuts. Want to join the nut extravaganza? Nut up and join the nut posse. Join other members and get your sack of nuts pounded for free whenever you come in and make the creamiest nut milk you've ever had in your own kitchen. Crazy Norm's Nut Emporium, 420 John Brown Drive, or online at fortproles.com. Okay, so up through the 19th century, soil science to that point had it kind of existed as it needed to. People understood like the fundamentals of crop rotation, uh, manure, compost, and the basic tools in agriculture that for like a th thousands of years stood as kind of the framework for how like Europeans in particular had farmed and related to the soil beneath them. One of the earliest contributions to the development of soil science as a science beyond these basics outlined prior was our boy F.H. King. His book, Farmers of 40 Centuries, or Permanent Agriculture in China, Korea, and Japan, published in 1913, was a scathing critique to the development of the extractive farming practices, which had really escalated in the 19th and 20th century, both in the United States and in Europe. Fundamentally, what made King stand out from everyone else around him was that he challenged so much of the science at the time. Eat your heart out, Galileo. This cost him a career he had spent a lifetime building, but was crucial in the development of our understanding of soil science, as well as other things that he got himself into. Now, there's very little written about King's personal life, and very little even on his professional life. Now, this piece will try to highlight what does exist, and... Um, for the younger listeners, I guess, that are in college looking for research subjects, many of the people we're going to talk about in this series will cover this or be in the same category, but there's no doubt that there's really more research that needs to go into exploring more about his background. So there's, there's a lot of scholarship opportunity there. Because of this little bit of knowledge we have, we don't really know much about his politics, his opinions outside of work, or even his family life, really. Okay, so all I'm hearing is... We could probably just make make stuff up about this guy and no one can prove us wrong. Cite that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I read uh, F.H. King had uh, beef with W.B. Mason, the paper people. I'm assuming they would alive at the same time because, you know, two-letter names. You know, I hate that you're right about that. King was born on a farm in LaGrange near Whitewater, Wisconsin on June 8th, 1848. Now, this is only two years and a few hundred miles from where uh, Liberty Hyde Bailey would be born a decade later, who we'll be talking about in the next episode. King's childhood resembled many rural kids of the era. Small local schools in the country provided him with just basically a practical education, and he graduated from Whitewater State Normal School in 1872. Normal school, huh? They just threw that in there? Nothing says normal like putting it in your name. We're normal guys. Trust us. It's in the... Ooh. I think you're missing the low-hanging fruit here, which is that clearly this is where Normal Norm got his name. Oh my god, wait, how close was... How old? Remember we talked about it. He's ancient. Yeah, yeah. Because he was in the burial site in Georgia, He remember? founded the school. Or well, maybe the school was named after him. Yeah, he found the normal school. It all comes together. The normal school. 
So anyways, after graduating, he uh, continued to study whenever possible under the guidance of one of his teachers, Thomas Chamberlain. But like you know, no one that I know, he he had to, you know, pay his bills and work was more a priority than, you know, learning the things he wanted to learn. Yeah, you know, just just a couple things like food and housing and normal things. King taught high school science because, you know, that's as close to what he wanted to research in his free time anyway. And uh, he did that for three years directly after graduating, which is, you know, speaks to how different education was. And at the same time, he started researching on his own and writing, including a paper that he released in 1875 titled A Scheme for Plant Analysis, which, despite his lack of training, was so significant it would be later incorporated into the Ward Botanical Textbook series. I know you don't know what that is, but at the time, trust me, it's a big deal. I know what that is. See, there's just a clear sign that you're totally normal, Matt. Really? No. Andy addressed you all as nerds at the beginning of this episode. He was right. Oh, true. So this opened up a whole bunch of new opportunities for his career in the sciences, during which he was able to do what he considered fun things, like geological surveys in northern Wisconsin in 1876, and later that year became a student at Cornell University to study the quote-unquote sciences. I mean, why can't we bring that back? That's just fascinating. Like, in the 19th century... College was just, like, something you could do, but wasn't really required for anything. Like, scientists, yeah, college might help, but not something you've got to do. You can just literally go in a basement and start doing stuff. Yeah, except for being normal. You did. You do have to go to school you, for that. You do have to get a degree in normalcy, yeah. In normal, yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Did not get that one. No, you did not. No, it is, uh, it is lacking on that resume. It is funny that you said you could just go in your basement and do science, because that's going to come up, actually. I know! <laughs> and, I got, Jesus God, do I not want to know what science you're doing in your basement, Andy. Not me. My boy, F.H. King. Okay. So, so <laughs> it, See I what my boy you. is doing in the basement. Y- yes. Uh, in 1880, King married Carrie Baker of nearby Berlin, Wisconsin. She would be that unsung hero that pushed his research forward. Not just his book that got published after his death, but was actually very instrumental in a bunch of other things. She supported him emotionally in his research. She also worked with him on his research in making maps and relief models uh, that they developed a mechanical process for in 1884. And this allowed them to produce maps quickly, which were sold to schools around the country. And he couldn't have done any of that without his wife, Carrie Baker. By the time he was 36 years old, he'd produced enough significant research in three different fields of science that was considered groundbreaking, map making, soil biology, and in his, his bird orthology areas, ornithology. There we go. So like at 36, he basically had already like been groundbreaking and, you know, went to the normal school. So it turns out he wasn't as normal as he thought. So she was just as knowledgeable about science as he was, sounds like. At least from the evidence, she had no formal education, but honestly, basically, there's been no no more than a few sentences written about her, and it was about her publishing his book and getting married to him. Wow. Uh, classic history. Pew, pew. She sounds like she was a badass basement scientist right alongside him. Badass basement scientist. That's a, Is that our bumper sticker? No, it sounds like a band, though. Babs. I like it. All right. So part of the reason isn't just that they didn't write anything about women back then, but also because most of the records of the normal school were lost in a fire in the late 1800s, which also destroyed many of the maps that King and Baker had made at this time. While we don't know much about her, one thing we do know is that she did live to 100 and died in 1952, which is also absolutely wild since all of their great-grandkids are dead, based on the records that I could find. So, like, her great-grandkids only outlived her by, like, 70 years at most. And I, I think they, the last one died in the 90s. So, like, she wasn't far behind her great grandkids and, like, having a full life, which is just wild. You know what, listeners? If, uh, if you're one of the great grandchildren or great great grandchildren of Franklin King, you want to, uh, you want to hit us up? That real niche audience. Yes. Just, just looking for, just looking for one. We, we talked about that he, like, has this bright, career planned right so in 1888 only four years later 
King was appointed professor of agricultural physics at the University of Wisconsin, where coincidentally or not, his high school teacher that had been teaching him on the side, Thomas Chamberlain, was president. Sure, that was coincidence. The position he was given was the first of its kind, allowing King to explore exactly what fell under his oversight and really just follow his interests. It was at the same school that the first soil, uh, soil science courses would be offered in 1889, and King was a central figure in their development, unsurprisingly. Now, like many of the faces we're going to be talking about in the series, his contributions to agriculture are, were only part of what made him great. What was also equally important for King was developing textbooks for his students because that would go on to span six editions and would be used across the entire country in different schools. For him, it was always about understanding this role of the march of progress and that for future generations to succeed, he needed to provide the tools for those successes. Although I think previously we have <laughs> talked on this podcast about like the myth of progress. Is that a name drop of Tom Wessel's book? I'm just saying it's interesting. Well, I feel like he sort of understood that progress wasn't going to happen in his lifetime. So he made a point to be a good teacher and to pass on the skills so that there could be progress. Maybe not, you know, he didn't want to, maybe he understood he wasn't going to be able to put his name and get famous on it, but he knew that the material was going to be important. Yeah, so it seems kind of cool. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of foresight there in what he was doing. Always important. While King was most focused on soils, as you can see, he had a lot of different interests. The influences of his work outside of soil are very much still felt today. So, for example, King led the research behind the development of the cylindrical silo that proved to uh, prove the shape was more strong and um, reduce spoilage. Now, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about like the thing we all envision when you think of like the big rural farms, you know, the big tube thing with the cone at the bottom. He also oversaw the first year long study of windmills for power generation. And he also led some of the earliest studies on the effects of slope gradient an aspect on the temperature of fruit tree trunks, which impacts how orchards are now planted across the globe, particularly, you know, vineyards. So he figured out how to store corn longer, map landscapes, discovered birds and plant species, and made wine better. And those weren't even his, like, main thing. He also had a badass wife on the side who probably knew how to do more shit, too. So that sounds like a power couple if I've ever heard one. Hell yeah. Yeah, basically. So, so he had this like, really broad scope of work, right? What was uncommon, though, is that each of his work was significant on their own. He'd be famous for a number of different things, and he did all of them. At the University of Wisconsin, King's focus had adjusted a bit away from plants to soil water requirements and tillage. Now, this makes sense given the time frame of his research. Petrochemicals were not being studied or were not being applied to fields at significant scale, and these were basically the two most impactful areas to increase production. His studies proved to be the foundation for our understanding of water absorption in soils, and his invention, the sampling tube, was the precursor to the Vemeyer sampler, which is used to take core samples on farms today. Again, no big deal. He just had a, uh, just had like a cheat code for figuring this shit out. Yeah, Rosebud, but for soil inventions. Rosebud? Yeah, it's like a... Cheat code for the game The Sims for, like, infinite money. Oh my god, how old are you? Younger than Andy. By, like, six months. Four <laughs> months. Still younger, even though time doesn't matter. Still younger. Okay. But is that, like, a, that's a Citizen Kane. That's what Rosebud was from, right? That is another is. famous Rosebud, yes. Oh, is it not? It's, yeah, it's, that's, what it's the probably, that's what the cheat yeah. code is a nod to, yeah, probably. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah yes. We should do a deep dive episode on The Sims codes in in the content reason why they exist true maybe on the patreon elliot that's all contextualizing you contextualizing cheat codes i i my nose is bleeding yes. if we add that it's very it. important you can't truly appreciate a cheat code if you don't understand the depth of knowledge that if goes we into why that, it exists if we add that to the list i'm leaving yeah what does uh he's he's never been more serious in his life in age of empires what's the significance behind trucks 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 where you just get to spawn monster trucks everything is content all right, let's get back to his work. So uh, our buddy King was very interested in this idea of water absorption in soils. It ended up changing the course of how we managed landscapes for decades and uh, also set his career trajectory on a very specific path. Yeah, it's going to be interesting how this plays out. 
So his studies correlated uh, increases in yield with irrigation, specifically in sandy soils. This, of course, makes t- uh, sense now because of our understanding of like cation exchange. But at the time, it was really groundbreaking. His, uh, groundbreaking. So his suggestion of increased irrigation, even in humid regions that historically would not get irrigation, it challenged a lot of the conventional science around crop needs. Now, it was during these studies in the 1890s that King began experimenting with this idea of earth mulching and came to the conclusion that about one-fifth of the water used by well-managed crops was lost from the soil surface. And that's a figure that's actually still used today for humid regions. And boom, the Permian movement was born. Or at least they'll claim it. I mean, isn't that all that really matters? King definitely had some, like, not that I would know, but like ADHD or something going on because you can watch no. his career develop as he like goes through a series of like info dumps on different subjects. Wow, Mr. Pot, what do you notice about this kettle? I wasn't criticizing, just commenting. On better understanding water retention, King's next challenge was to find out how the roots of a plant impacted how water and nutrients were harvested. So you can see him go from like soil to saving soil to the water in the soil, to the roots getting the water in the soil. Like, you know, th- this goes through this, like, whole thing. Now, to do this whole, like, testing of how roots took up water and nutrients, he developed new methods for pulling out whole root systems and later brought plants into lab settings to watch how these roots absorbed water. Okay, so now we're starting the basement science stuff. We're getting there. So he saw how the water distribution of the soil materials in the glass columns that were used to watch the water levels change as the plants absorbed water were influenced by the rate of water flow. Working alongside Charles E. Schlichter, Schlichter, I don't know, Schlichter, not, I feel like it should be Schlichter, but it's not pronounced, not spelled that way. Oh, yeah, no. Right? It's got that vibe. Schlick. Working along our buddy Charlie here. Chuck. The experience, Chucky, Chucky, Chuck and e. <laughs> Chucky King. So our buddy Chuck here. The work he was doing with F.H. King ended up becoming the basis for his landmark research on the theory of groundwater movement. Oh, yes, of course. The landmark Slichter theory of groundwater movement. Absolutely. He remembers that from the normal school. Totally normal. Totally normal, Elliot. I don't know what the fuck I just said. Basically, his collaboration was the basis for how we understand groundwater movement today. As you can probably tell, as obsessed as he was with soil, its relation to water became just as much of an interest. He studied water tables in relation to any variable. Topography, cropping history, other drainage systems, basically anything. To Elliot's question about basement science, he even had a well installed in his basement with recording equipment to hear and follow the water that was flowing through the ground around his house. I mean, that sounds pretty cool, but... Yeah, maybe a little bit obsessive, even by our weird standards. Speak for yourself, I'm totally normal. You went to the normal school. Come on, man. I didn't. I learned the normal way. At the normal school? The nor- no, the other normal way. In the streets. <laughs> with <laughs> with norm. norm? Normal Norm taught me everything. <laughs> Speaking of normal Norm, we should probably listen to a very weird commercial. Hey there, it's Andy from the Poor Proles Almanac, and... And we're not the Poor Proles Almanac. You're right. We are tomorrow, today. And I'm Nash Flynn from Death and Friends. Tomorrow, today is our chance to talk to folks about cutting-edge research that helps us understand what tomorrow looks like, but today. We've got exciting guests. And we'll speculate wildly about what the future looks like. Will the ocean currents slow down in your lifetime, leaving temperate climates decimated? Will we go to Mars? Will we drown in climate-induced ocean floods filled with microplastics? Will new research rewrite the history our children read? Will the sun... Is this going to be another Doomer question? No. Tomorrow, today, wherever you get your podcasts, and also on Instagram. Welcome back, everyone, as we wrap up FHK's story. Or sorry, FH King. We're doing the two, two initials, last name. FH so. King story. I think we've earned, he's earned the, the additional initial. Are we just going to do FHK now? No, I think FH King. Then we can just pretend a bunch of streets are named after him. We can just abbreviate it to Fa King. I'm surprised when Andy hasn't done that yet. Fa King. Fa King. Oh, didn't even think of that. Look at that. All right, so fucking's conclusion then yes. from his basement well and uh, all the other research he was doing was that we could understand water flow on short distances through like calculations. 
which we can do today. They couldn't back then, but he knew it would be possible. However, the idea of like long distance travel would be basically impossible to calculate because of how much diversity and the infinite variables that would exist on a large scale. And to be honest, that's still a challenge for modern researchers. Now, unsurprisingly, as King had begun to amass a wealth of knowledge and groundbreaking knowledge around soil health, he quickly was on the radar of government officials. Oh, no. This is why your people come in, Elliot. Yep. (laughs) He just laughs. Unlike the CIA, he was poached in 1901 by the Bureau of Soils in Washington, D.C. Oh, I guess that's better. Excited to have the government support his work and to have access to the tools of power that he thought would be available to him, because clearly he knew nothing about how government works, he continued to dive further into his research, although his time in D.C. would be short-lived. Ah, there it is. Yeah, something bad happens, doesn't it? I feel like it does. He was a man of science, Elliot. That's all I'm going to say. All right, kids, don't do science unless it's in your basement. Or you work for the CIA already. And they tell you to do the science. Yeah, yeah. Anything that has bureau or cabinet in it's no good. You want to be centralized and and and, inte- and, and intelligent with a, <laughs> with a bunch of agents working together with you. So King was uh, hired to lead soil climatology investigations, which were actually already in progress when he was hired. Now, with the resources to back him, he oversaw more research than he could personally handle. And he recruited a fellow instructor from the University of Wisconsin to come join him. Having explored soil health and how water worked through the soil, he carried his new knowledge and interest into researching the way airflow impacted erosion and crop health, as well as how fertilizers impacted different types of soils, as the government had begun experimenting with what you could say were different ways to apply nutrients to soils. So even though the Haber-Bosch process hadn't been discovered yet? That is correct. They hadn't figured out how to easily create nitrogen from the Haber-Bosch process, but fertilizers existed and they were often used from mined minerals or uh, from back guano, which were expensive and difficult to source quickly. So research went into how to use these more efficiently, even if they weren't a huge part of how agriculture operated to this point. Yeah, man. How could you forget how hard it is to harvest guano, Matt? Come on, Matt. Matt. Guys, I'm sorry. Jesus, man. I'm sorry. I forgot about the guano, and wasn't wasn't it like a an act where Americans were like claiming islands with guam guano on them? Guamo, you mean? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Guant- know what to hear. I can't even do it. Guant- Guantanamo Bay. Guant- you mean? Guant- 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 I can't. Right, I'm it's too much. Guano. Yeah, I just broke you both. Um. I don't know about that, but every time I hear guano, I can only think of Ace Ventura. Yeah, it was literally called the Guano Islands Act. That is the most American thing. Enable citizens of the United States to take possession in the name of the United States of islands that had guano on them. That's awesome. And, and where are those islands now, Matt? Uh, probably still in Polio Micronesia. I meant, like, do they still have Americans? Oh, uh, I don't know, but they probably have less guano. Probably. Now, uh, to get back to our fucking guy, the conclusions that all of his research came to at this time have since been better understood, but those first studies were uh, not successful. They were novel attempts to basically quantify the relationship between the atmosphere and the soil, which is valid, but um, they didn't have the full tools yet. Okay, so that's a soft way of saying his results are wrong. Well, no. The research was focused on how soil gas exchange influences plant and soil health, and they really just didn't know the extent of what they were looking at. But again, he hadn't started this research or something he walked into, so I can't put all the blame on him. But once it was wrapped up, King was able to focus on challenging other conventional science around the amount of nutrients drawn from soils by plants. This all manifested in a multi-year research project that was summarized in six manuscripts developed by King. However, only three were published at first, although the other three manuscripts were actually far more important. Dun, dun, dun. So here's the the juicy stuff. This is probably why he didn't stay in D.C. because he was just too smart for the place, right? Yeah. So in the three unpublished papers, King challenged the conventional science. But here's the thing that maybe, maybe was a bad idea. It didn't just challenge the conventional science. 
it challenged the guy who hired him, Milton Whitney, who was chief of the bureau. Oh, so he showed his boss up. Yeah, I can see how that wouldn't go over well in uh, in Washington. Yeah, now, not only did he challenge Whitney's ideas, they were in direct conflict with recent research published by Whitney only two years prior, and which also he may or may not have had a part in and then rescinded his name from publication. Wait, King had a part in it and rescinded it? He had done some of the preliminary research and supposedly pulled his name off of it because he didn't like the conclusions that they came to because he was like, this is a poor fucking analysis. I don't want my name on this shit. Which, you know, again, goes really well with your supervisor. Now, Whitney's argument in his paper, and uh, you're going to love this, was that chemistry of soils is of little or no importance to crop production. He goes as far as to say that the concentration of plant nutrients in the soil is the same in productive and unproductive soils, and that all soils fundamentally have enough nutrients for satisfactory plant growth, and conclusively, those soils had enough nutrients to last indefinitely. He shit on his boss. (laughs) Yeah, honestly, that seems deserved. That's, That's kind of like a wild... I don't know, maybe, maybe, like, you know, we're looking at it now with the benefit of knowing more about soil, but, like, really? Like, (laughs) yeah, basically. Now, then you just, like, grow crops in the same field for a few years in a row, and you, like, know? Yeah, so, like, to that point, like, in retrospect, this seems, like, really silly, right? But it does speak to how revolutionary King's ideas were at the time. Not to say he was the only one saying that this was wrong. Like I said, a lot of people believe that King had been involved in the research and was just like, no, I'm not putting my name on this. He ghostwrote it. <laughs> he, he ghosted it. He did not ghostwrite shit. He was like, here's the evidence. Don't, don't fucking utter my name. <laughs> yeah, me? Research? No, n- never heard of it. Yeah, and like I said, we don't know for sure, but we do know that much of the data was actually collected by King, which typically with like his name and like the fact that he was like clearly this up and coming star, uh, his absence is like suspicious. And basically Whitney's conclusion was that since it was not chemical composition that drove plant growth, it was explicitly tied to moisture and temperature, which was again, going back to King's early work, why he was interested in hiring him. He literally hired the guy because he thought he would prove his evidence correct when instead he did the exact opposite. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, very, it's a very, very, very government bureau chief when stuff just blows up in your face. He wasn't really meant to be in the government, his boss. So basically he hired the guy because he was doing groundbreaking research in an area he cared about, and then he got mad when the groundbreaking research King did didn't line up with his own personal research. Yeah. He didn't like the fucking research. Yeah, he was like, Dude, be groundbreaking, but like like me groundbreaking, <laughs> not like really groundbreaking, like ground shaking. Be groundbreaking ground in the ways that I want you to be. This is how science works. What's really important to understand is that there really just wasn't a lot of established science around soil, which is why he was like the first in so many different things. Now, like I said, King uh, wasn't the only person to challenge Whitney's research. There are many people that like basically shit on him for it like sir edward john russell who wrote extensively on the poor conclusions made by whitney's team and he didn't go by ej russell i don't know i don't trust this guy not even a little bit i don't trust him i mean ej russell is a like that's a that's a that's a solid one that's a respectable name sounds like he could have invented basketball what if he went by e john russell which he did maybe Uh, a shittier sport like hockey no, I, I think I think that passes. You just call hockey shittier than basketball? I just wanted to see the look you on your would, face when you I would said that. You never say that to me if I was in the room with you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, no. But from 1,500 miles. Hide behind a screen. More proof of the millennialness. Yep, that's it. Cancel me now. So yeah, while there were people writing about this and being like, no, you're a fucking idiot. King was, you know, an internal in- instigator who is challenging this, like, uniform position by the Bureau, capital B Bureau, right? And uh, basically, by January of 1904, he was pushed out of the Bureau of Soils. 
What were they called? Was it Bureau of Soils? Bureau of Soil Science or something? Either way, it's not a not a good look for the trust the science crowd, is it? I mean, whose science is really the problem? The the, the wrong one. Yeah. First off, there's no wrong science, but well, it, it's like, <laughs> well, hang on. So wait, wait a second. Tell that to Mr. Whitney. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of like the there's three kinds of lies: lies, damn lies, and statistics. And, like, it is, like, this kind of slippery area, right, for obvious reasons. But also really important, uh, points to why it's really important to have, like, a collection of evidence to draw from, right? Not just, like, one or two studies. You know, fully understanding the evidence that exists, right, and, like, where it came from to actually know if uh, the science you're supporting actually has some soundness to it, right? We talked about this really deeply, both in the Native Pollinator episode, where Elliot thought I was losing my shit, because I went down a real rabbit hole. You're going to have to be way more specific on the episode if you're losing your shit. Well, the, the bee pollinator, if native pollinators are being out-competed yeah. by... Huh? Yes, that one. But also recently with the black walnuts and juglone, right? Yeah, those juglones. Woo, woo. Wow. Not something I ever thought I'd hear from you, Elliot. But here we are. Is it because I don't have the face paint on? Maybe. So yeah, like all this ties into this like really interesting conversation about like what the science says right and his argument was like the science is wrong and i'm gonna challenge it so what happened to his other three manuscripts that you mentioned so the manuscripts that were not published didn't just disappear uh when king returned home to wisconsin uh he worked to get them published after getting approval from the secretary of agriculture not a good look for whitney that secretary of agriculture was like yeah man get those get those out there we need those now at this point king was nearly 50 years old and he decided to focus efforts on two primary projects after these papers were finally published. One was a soil management book, which is no surprise. And then his other one was a book on ventilation of farm buildings in rural schools. Dude, I love these old scientists. They could just specialize in anything. Literally just like, hey, I care about this thing. I'm going to spend a couple months and now I'm the expert. Honestly, the it's, expert. it's a good thing to provide information on. A lot of people, a lot of people really like close up their barns with animals in them. Then they, uh, you know, condensation from their breath and then the animals get colder than they would have been. Not that Matt's read his books, but you know, he might have read his books. It's, Im it's important stuff. You got to ventilate your, your barns and schools. Ventilate your cows, everyone. You heard it here first. And your kids. And your kids. Fuck some kids. <laughs> I was going to say, make sure they have lots of holes in their little boxes you keep them in or whatever. Yeah. I don't know anything about kids. All right. So now we're getting towards the end of King's life, right? So he's done all this research. He's written almost 100 papers, outsmarted the head of his division at the for the government. Now he's getting towards the end of his life, wants to get these books out, right? Now, all the research for these books had already been done. And uh, King's primary focus was basically on organizing the information in a way that he thought would be accessible to the general public. The only thing that was left for him to do outside of, because of his extensive knowledge in soil science was to travel. And he really wanted to travel to Japan, Korea, and China, which he did in 1909. King actually cashed in his life insurance in order to take this trip, which would become the keystone of his research that went into the soil management text and in many ways would be the first domino in America's permanent agriculture movement. Did you say he cashed in his life insurance? He just, like, abandoned his wife, who supported him through his career, traveled across country with him twice, and raised his kids, and was just like, yeah, you get nothing. Yeah, basically. Yeah, they didn't have social security or nothing back then either. That's pretty brutal. Damn. The house was standing. Like, what more do you want, Elliot? Come on. I don't it know, man. 1909. And also, how do you cash in a life insurance policy without dying? How the fuck does that work? Uh, I think when you get old enough, you can. Hmm. Don't ask me. I'm only a tax accountant. What the fuck would I know about I that? I am sure they took those clauses out. Yeah, maybe maybe because uh, who knows? Anyways, so while we don't know much about the specifics of his trip outside of what exists in the book, when he arrived home, basically his final focus was really get this book done as quickly as possible. His goal for his travels had been to learn the ways in which the East had been maintaining long-term soil health for thousands of years. Something that he knew the United States was really just running out of time to figure out. I mean, we're only talking about 20 years before the Dust Bowl. So, like, the writing was on the wall. 
In his book, he details his travels and observations throughout Asia, focusing primarily on the fields and gardens in the villages themselves, how they organized the organizing process of cycling nutrients. So not just this idea of like, you know, cover crops and things like that, but understanding that erosion happens and like making up for that, utilizing things like human manure, which allowed for basically higher density populations to exist without the need for significant, you know, inputs. You uh, you saying he wanted to close the poop loop? Hey, if guano works, we, we can close the loop ourselves. The book basically paints a picture of a sustainable society. And I really do recommend it. It's a really interesting read. King makes note of the fact that even in these systems, erosion is a problem. I think what's really interesting is that he, he highlights the fact that farmers spend the time to recycle nutrients that had washed away. The idea of like utilizing canals dredging, and uh, a number of other tactics to try to, again, take the time to cycle those nutrients back in. Like if we talk about permaculture, a lot of it is about like the closed loop, right? But a lot of it's also about like following nature systems, right? Um, whereas the, the idea of like dredging is not following nature systems. The book is an interesting and worthwhile read even today. And um, while it might not be like a full guide on what restoration looks like, it's really worth contextualizing it. And again, understanding it within this historical, you know, status as this book that was entirely ahead of its time, at least for like white people, right? Like, I think all of this comes with that caveat of like, for white people, like a hundred years ago, 110 years ago, he was writing books highlighting what people are still arguing about today, right? But when he was writing it, as we just discovered or talked about, the respected scientists at the time didn't even believe that soil health was even like a thing. That was like a fucking myth. I mean, that's what happens when you conduct science in your basement. Yeah. You become science guru. Is that what's in hiding behind the wall? The fuck is that Edgar Allan Poe book, a short story? Oh, the Telltale Heart? The no, that's the one in the floorboards. Oh, the person that got oh, buried in the, in the wall? The cask yeah. of... Up. Cask of Monte, uh, Monteado? Yes. Cask... We're going with that. It's probably wrong, but we're going with it. I don't have a master's degree in English. Don't ask those kinds of no, questions. No, I think that me. was it. Yeah, that's it. Look at me. Glad good, I spent that $40,000. Good job, Andy. So uh, King died on August 4th, 1911. He was still working on finishing his book. The final chapter hadn't been written. He had the research done. After he died, his wife, Carrie, assembled the materials for the chapter and finished the final chapter of the manuscript. So if you want to go support Carrie, go read that last chapter. Fuck the rest of the book. <laughs> Alongside his book, a final editorial was released defending his positions on soil science, and again, this was put together by Carrie. Dude, she really was a good wife. The motherfucker was dead, and she was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to finish his work for him. She really had that, that boomer grind set, right? Oh my god. With no social security, mind you. Boomer grind set. And no life insurance. Honestly, though, not not a bad retirement plan, getting that book money. Yeah, so in over the course of his life, King, King managed to write over 130 articles, put out five books, and uh, his whole idea was to make knowledge as accessible as possible. Oh yeah. An idea I've never heard of. Now, although he never lived to see his positions accepted as consensus in the scientific community... His work was so groundbreaking in the development of like how we understand agriculture today that it's really fundamental to understand the work that he did to make all of what we believe today possible. Yeah, and I shout out to his wife, Carrie King, who's probably why his name even exists as a footnote in history today. I really think she was the unsung hero of this, and I'm pretty sure she had a lot to do with his basement science. Hell yeah. Let's hear it for Carrie. Let's hear it for Carrie. So this has been fun, and next week we're going to be talking about Liberty Hyde Bailey. So I'm really excited about that. He was born 10 years after King. Very interesting, similar, but very different story. And um, arguably the most imper important person in botany and social understanding of soil science and our relationship to ecology, arguably in the history of Anglo-speaking countries. So I'm real excited about that one. But until then, if you want to go listen to part one of that, it's up on our Patreon now. If you want to read a little bit more in depth on King, we have our sub stack. Go check out the article. It came out at the same time as this episode. And like everything else, if you want to hear it early, read it early, jump on Patreon. Yeah, and we'll so, get we'll get bumper yeah. stickers for this episode. She carried she, she carried, carried this a, ass. She carried a king. 
Wow. All right. That was better than mine. Yeah, it is. I usually come up with stuff that's better than you, Andy. That's why I'm here. You know what? <laughs> Dom, hit the music like 15 seconds before you said yeah, that. I just edited it out. <laughs> Never heard it. No one's ever going to hear you be smart, Elliot. Damn it. I'll start my own podcast. I swear to God. Sounds like the beer Good. chief, Andy. Yeah, I am. Burying your evidence. Burying your evidence.